Hello everybody, it certainly is good to be back, uh, having two weeks off. I know I had done a little bit of a devotional recording for you and didn't get one last week, but certainly it's good to be back, the refreshment is very good. We do need that, all of us. Uh, we are a part of the body of Christ, we have His strength and we have the Spirit in us, but yet we physically still can need a little break, so it's good to be back though. I want to pick up our study that we've been doing in Revelation on the message to the churches. The Spirit speaks to the churches. You know, Jesus is dictating these letters, and it's like, what exactly is he saying? And, well, we're going to pick it up here looking at Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. We've already looked at four <clears throat> cities, um, and we're now going to look at three more starting today with Sardis. It says here, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. I have, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time. I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. To the churches. First off, looking at Sardis, which is a, a city, it was an ancient city that sat in basically what would be considered today West Central Turkey, if you will. It's a former capital of the rich and famous kingdom of Lydia. Yeah, you may have heard of that in history, uh, but this city, they refined much gold here, they found all kinds of evidence of that. They had, uh, there was, they were at a major intersection of trade routes. They grew cotton, I, I learned, and they may actually have been the creators or the perfectors of dyeing wool. They had a big textile type of industry, if you will say there. Obviously, not the way we make it today, but they did do a lot of this. And it's also thought, from what I was reading, that Aesop actually may have come from Sardis. Remember Aesop's fables? There you go, that guy. Well, at the time of the letter, of this letter, it's written to the church, Sardis is a dying and decaying city. It is a, a shell of its former self. Now, it had been destroyed or damaged very, very severely by an earthquake around 17 AD. Jesus was, of course, alive at that time. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the Roman emperor had paid to rebuild a lot of it. But it's still a shell of its former self. It's not at all the kind of glory and splendor that it used to have kind of like the church. And the congregation is really reflecting what's going on in the city. It's not what it used to be. But we find again that Jesus is the one who's dictating this letter. We have here the, the aspect about the seven spirits of God or the seven-fold <clears throat> spirit is probably the better translation here. It would simply means the full spirit of God. And Jesus has the full spirit of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you have the full spirit of God, you have God, that's God, of course, saying, well, Jesus is God, is what kind of affirmation there. And not only that, but it's also for confirming to us, too, that Jesus is represented in his church by God, the Holy Spirit. Yes, or also known as the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit has lots of names, but he is all God, the Holy Spirit, the same. And again, he is Lord over all the leaders of the church. He is Lord over all the people in the church. They serve him. And he gives an evaluation as he is Lord, <clears throat> the head of the church, and he's giving an evaluation to these guys. Now, sometimes you go to work, and on the job, you have to get an evaluation of how you're doing. And sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not so good. And usually it's decent, at least, and you get then something to work on. That's usually what you'll find. Here, Jesus doesn't really give them anything good. This is not a good evaluation, it's a bad one. Now, first off, they do have a good reputation. However, that reputation comes not from the presence. That's the way a reputation works. You don't get a reputation because of what you do right now. 
You have a reputation because of what you did in the past. And that's the problem. This congregation was alive in Christ. That's good. They were doing things well. The city used to be a thriving city. It's falling apart. The church was probably a thriving church. They were faithful in doing what God was asking of them. And Jesus now says, you're dead. You are dead. I can't imagine hearing the words, those words from Jesus. It's got to be devastating to hear that. You see, a congregation cannot play church. You have to be the church every single day, not once in a while or in the past. Oh, man, look what we used to do 20 years ago. Man, look at the glory days. Hey, celebrate what you've done. Yes, and what God has done. But you can't live in the past. If you live in the past, you forfeit your future. You've got to live for today. You celebrate the past, live today with an eye to the future. That's what we need to be doing. This church wasn't doing that. As a matter of fact, this church wasn't doing a lot. I want to read a section here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, if you listen to the words, uh, beginning of verse 15 of chapter 5. And he, that's Christ, died for all, and those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Obviously, we should live for Christ. The Sardis church was not. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This church seems to have forgotten this. This is now continue reading. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, which is, listen, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You don't live for yourself, you live for Christ. You are a new creation, the old is gone, so therefore you're a new person, you're alive in Christ, you live for him, you've been given this ministry of reconciliation, so therefore your sins are not held against you, so you need to take that message and you need to be proclaiming it in the world, and the message is, be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. This is what this church in Sardis was not doing. You see, a dead church does not preach the Word of God. A dead church does not live by the Word of God. A dead church does not share the gospel message of Jesus Christ as being the only one through whom people may be saved. We just read what a church, a living church, a, live, a church that is alive does. Sardis was a dead church. They were not doing it. They were not living for themselves. I mean, living for Christ. They were living for themselves. They weren't doing the ministry of reconciliation. They were, who knows what they were doing. Obviously, it wasn't godliness. It was worldliness. So Jesus is calling them to action. He says, as we read, to wake up. And he wants them to remember some things. Remember what it is that you received or believed. For example, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and receive him as Lord and you will be a child of God. John 1, 12. Not an exact quote, of course. He also says, if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. Those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 13. All must be born again by the Holy Spirit, John 3, 3. And you will be a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we just read. Basically, Jesus is saying to the congregation, you remember this. Remember what you received. Yeah, I remember those verses. Well, then live out that reality every day. 
You are a child of God. Live it. Don't say, oh yeah, I'm a child of God on Sundays and I disappear the rest of the week. No, you're a child of God every single day. Every hour. <clears throat> Whether you're awake or not, you're a child of God. If you have received and believed in the name of Jesus Christ. As Lord and Savior. <clears throat> it's not always easy doing that, though. Sometimes we forget. We get too caught up in the world and live in the past. Kenosha, Wisconsin. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was a man who was, uh, had an arrest warrant out on him. He was involved in some sort of domestic disturbance. 911 was called. Police came regarding him. He struggled with the police officers. He obviously ignored their commands, reached into his vehicle. He did have a knife, we know that. And then he was shot seven times. He was not killed. He is in the hospital, and he may not walk again, but he should live. Anger, of course, erupted after this occurred. Again, we don't know every circumstance. We don't know everything, but there were mistakes made, and whatever mistakes were. But based on the state of things today, if you heard when you heard this, it would not be unexpected to have violence. And we did. Because unbridled, uncontrolled anger turns to rage. Anger is a godly emotion. But when it's unbridled and uncontrolled, it turns to rage, which enables people and pushes people to burn cars, loot businesses, throw bricks at people, even to have it where you shoot people and... People end up dying. This is what the world is like. You want to see worldliness? That's where it goes. Unbridled, uncontrolled, that's what happens when the human emotion just and anger just, just goes. That's where we get. That's what we get. This is the world. This is not what we as Christians are to be like. No, we are not to be like that. The body of Christ is not to be like that. We are not to support that and encourage that. No, no, no. We don't do that. That's not the way we behave. Because you and I, you know, you can get angry. I can get angry. There are things that trigger you. There are things that trigger me. We know what they are. And they can be very different things. But there are things that get you. It just, oh, just makes your blood boil sometimes. But through Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold spirit, the seven spirits of God, if you want to call it that, again, I like the sevenfold spirit of God instead. That anger that can be inside of you can be controlled. It can be transformed and be used as motivation for bringing good into the world, not evil and revenge. Reality for us as believers is that Jesus is Lord. I live for Him because in Him I am alive. In other words, if I'm in Christ, I am alive. But if I am apart from Christ, I am not alive. I can't live apart from Christ. Not for eternity. I can't be made a new creation. I can't be forgiven. I have to have Christ. Without Christ, it ain't possible. The church of Sardis appears to be living for the world. Because Jesus says, you're dead. If you're dead, that means they're not in him. If they're not in him, guess what? They must be in the world. That's what they must be living for themselves. Yeah, they got some past glory, but they ain't got nothing going on in their life. It says, you're dead. You know, sometimes things can look pretty bleak. I have to admit, in Sardis and the church, <laughs> this is a pretty bleak outlook. You know, Elijah, he had a pretty bleak outlook too. <clears throat> northern tri northern uh, ten tribes of Israel broke away from the southern portion of Judah. Kept the name Israel. It's after Solomon reigned. And Elijah, he became king during Ahab. I can king, he became prophet during Ahab and Jezebel. What an ugly time period for him to be around. Not easy. He got to the point, even after he had a tremendous victory at Mount Carmel, he thought he was the last remaining faithful one in the whole land. That's what he believed, he was the last one. 
that's how discouraging he, discouraging it was and how fearful he could make, even though he had that incredible victory in Mount Carmel where God revealed himself and that Baal was nothing. And all the prophets of Baal that came up there were killed. And the people confessed that the Lord is God. But Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you too, Elijah. Elijah got so discouraged, he said, Lord, I'm the only one left. Just take me. God reminded him that there were several thousand in the land of Israel who remained faithful. In other words, they were the ones who were dressed in white, walking with the Lord. They had soiled their clothing yet, as Jesus was talking about this church. No matter how bad things can get, no matter how horrible things can seem, no matter how hopeless sometimes they may seem to you and stuff, and that emotion, that feeling, there's always a faithful remnant. Whether it's in a nation, whether it's in a community, whether it's in a church, whether it's in your family, whatever, there is a faithful remnant somewhere. God always has it. He always will. Start us having one. I don't know if it's one person, two people, ten, I don't know. All we know is that they had a faithful remnant. It's more than one, that we do know, because of the language used to. And Jesus is calling them to wake up and to strengthen some things in the church that are still alive. So in other words, it's like the church is it's dead, but mostly dead, not totally dead. If you know about the Princess Bride, you might remember that scene. <laughs> Where <laughs> he was, Wesley was mostly dead, not totally dead. I think that's what we have kind of here. You see, there's a remnant, and he's basically, Jesus is saying to them, wake up, strengthen the things that are still alive, and you also need to hold on to what you have, and you need to repent. But they're still alive. At least, they have a little bit of life there. Well, in other words, what I'm thinking here is what the, the visual you can do is a campfire. You know, when you go camping, you know, you're out there in the, in the, in the wilderness, and the, you know, I'm talking about tent camping and stuff, you're out there, and, and you're putting a nice campfire, you know, it's just, it's one of those things, you sit around, and you just enjoy it, you tell your stories and jokes and all this stuff, and just enjoy it. Well, it gets to the point where at some point at night, you finally go to bed, and there's usually just a nice big pile of, of bright red, almost whitish, reddish, whatever colors kind of in there, of hot coals. You wake up in the morning, it looks all gray, and you kind of stir them up, you might find a few uh, red or orange things still glowing. And if you actually work diligently and enough, you, know, you put some dry grass, or dry leaves on there, or some real tiny little twigs and so forth, mix in there too, and you lay them on there gently and, and fan it, kind of, especially when you start seeing smoke coming, you you blow, the next thing you know, all of a sudden, a little flame comes up and starts burning. I believe that's what you have in this church in Sardis. There's some very few, very small coals from the fire that had been burning in the past. And what we're finding is there's a few people in there who have not soiled their clothes, in other words, they have not joined in the worldliness and the sin that's in the church. Instead, what they have done is they have stayed faithful. But they are basically asleep. They are indifferent. They're not doing anything. Maybe they're cowering. Maybe they're afraid. I don't know. Whatever it is, they need to wake up. And Jesus is saying, wake up and basically fan those things back again because they can do it. And what he wants to see is he wants to see them get a fire going in that church once again and fan that flame from that little bit that's alive. There is hope. They need to do this. But if they do not do this, the church will then become totally dead and the Lord will come and judge it. So he's warning them, you need to get up. And you need to take those coals and work and there is potential life there. You can bring a revival in this church again. In other words, one person and God can make for a revival. You just have, all it takes is a believer who is willing to let the Lord work in and through them. And if you do that, guess what? You can take those little coals 
and build a fire once again. And that's what I believe that the Lord is asking of this remnant to do in this church. If not, the church will totally die and will be no more because the Lord will come against them in judgment. For you and I, are we willing to let God work through us? I don't believe we're in this situation ourselves. But you don't want to get there. So right now, are you willing to let God work in and through you? To bring about the change, the transformation that is needed in our world. That's, the, that's a key question for us. The Lord, of course, he continues, he, he says, you know, there's a promise for those of you who listen. For those of you who are willing, in other words, you will walk in white. White representing purity, white representing victory and celebration. We will celebrate with him and we will stand with him in white. Why? Because we have overcome. Not because we are victorious, as in we're strong and able, but because of what the Lord has done. Remember, I am alive in him. So I live for Him, and I am pure because of Him, not because of me. I overcome and have victory, and you overcome and have victory because you have faith in Jesus Christ. You, have, you overcome and have victory over sin and worldliness because you live for Christ, not for the world. You know that I'm alive in Him, so therefore I live for Him, and we overcome evil and have victory over it by following Christ not the world, keeping our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. You see, you do that. You and I do that. We will be with him and we'll stand with him. He says, you'll be with the white celebration, purity, victory, or the bride of Christ, the churches. And your name as a child of God will never be blotted out. It's there, the written Lamb's book of life. It's not going to change. And the Lord Jesus will even acknowledge you. Acknowledge any believer before our Father in heaven. Saying something like, you know, well done and whatnot, but probably the key words would be something like, this servant belongs to me. Well done. I'd like, it's my pleasure to introduce What a glorious day of the promise of God. But we've got to be faithful. We've got to remain faithful. And if we're not, repent. Let God work in you and through you. Because you're alive. You have life because you're alive in Christ. He ends his letter just as he has with many of the others. Where he has stated, Hey, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the question really for us as we conclude today is, are we listening to what the Spirit is saying to the church? And the answer is, if you say yes, and then a follow-up question would be, then what is he saying? It's easy to say, yeah, he's speaking. But what is he saying? Because the Lord wasn't just speaking then. He's speaking today too. So what is he saying to us as a congregation. Pray about it and listen. Let us pray. Father God, I do thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for your word and your truth. I pray today for us as a congregation, for everyone who may be listening, anyone um, watching, whatever their situation, I just pray for every single one as a body of believers that we would remain alive. We would not just look back what we did in the past. We would live for today, celebrate the past, and live for today with an eye towards tomorrow. And not only would we do that, but we would live for you, and we would carry forth your ministry of reconciliation, appealing to people to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And when you call, Lord, for us to repent, that we would do so. Father, I pray your blessing upon each and every one. We would live for you. 
and be willing to surrender our lives for you. Work in us and through us, Lord. The fan into flames, any kind of life that is in any location, so your light would shine forward. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Right. God bless you.